Being in the middle of nowhere can be frightening on its own. You might be running low on gas, you knew you should have stopped at that last exit, but you figured there'd be at least one more, right? But now you've been on the road, it's a stretch of 20, 30 miles now, and there's been absolutely no sign of a rest stop, gas station, or anything nearby. You run out of gas, and now you're at the mercy of whatever backcountry West Virginia Hills Have Eyes BS might be going down out in the middle of nowhere. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true middle of nowhere horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Be sure to hit that like button if you haven't yet, as it helps the swamp grow. Subscribe if you're new and turn on notifications as I upload new episodes almost every single day. Now. Let's jump right into these creepy and allegedly true middle of nowhere horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. Horrifying Experience in the Bush by T. S. I have had a few paranormal incidents a couple of times in my life. I'm mainly taking photos and seeing figures and orbs, but some still give me goosebumps today. But I will tell you an experience I had while scouting not that long ago. Here's some context. I'm an Eagle Scout and the oldest in my troop with the most experience. Meetings happen for the majority of the school year. During the winter, my troop tends to work on scout skills rather than camping. We were a small troop in a small town, so practicing these skills like orienteering and stuff like that was sometimes challenging. Our troop is within walking distance of a nice wooded area that has a beach filled with trails that everyone knows in the area, and we know them pretty much by heart, and we maintain these trails pretty often. A few months ago during a meeting, we were going to practice orienteering at night for the newer scouts. This would also help them experience night hiking and to experience situations that may arise while night hiking, either alone or with groups. Now, of course, it's dark out. Everyone has lights on and we're starting to walk on these sandy, muddy, dark trails. It's a lot easier said than done, to be honest. We get about less than a mile in and everyone can see and hear the scouts in front of us and behind us fairly well. I'm walking through an area where we all stop to see the tide in the area, and I swear I hear giggles, like a young girl giggling, like a toddler in the brush. I looked around the area, but there was absolutely nothing. I asked the people around me if they had heard it, and they said they had not heard anything. Now, I thought maybe it's just my mind playing tricks on me, so we continue going down the trail, and I swear at the next marker it happens again. Now I knew this was off since no one would be on these trails or in the area at all at night, especially this far in. It was super windy and the, the weather was pretty cold, honestly. People would be at home. When we leave the area and return to the scout room, we are single file line going through the mud. And I swear once again, I hear that voice again. But this time, it was like screaming in my ear and then giggling once more before stopping for good. I asked the scout behind me, but they didn't hear it. I questioned the scout in front of me, and still, nothing. And that's it. That's my experience. We come back to the scout room and function like normal once again. Thank you for sharing my experience, even though it might be a little anticlimactic. A Local Murder by Skeleton Circus This was in the mid-2000s when I was about second or third grade. I lived in the rural Midwest and attended a decently sized elementary school. For a few weeks, a friend I had chatted with often was absent from school. I was confused and curious about why he hadn't attended school for so many days. Soon I found out from other kids at the school that he was taking time to rest and recover after a very traumatic experience in his family. I'm not really going to reveal names or anything like that, 
I do not remember the boy's name anyway, and I don't want to disclose any personal information about those whose names I do remember. For easier reading, I will call the boy who is absent Mike. The standard chats and occasional gossip I'd share with friends on the playground and in the cafeteria took a very dark turn once word got out of why Mike was actually absent. One day a friend of mine, let's call him Chad, told us that Mike's mother was murdered. Hearing later from some of the school employees and even my own parents, I found out that the boyfriend of Mike's sister carried out this horrific act. The killer had snuck into the bedroom of his girlfriend's mother's house. He had then stabbed her to death and slit her throat in her sleep. I don't recall the exact details. I was only 9 or 10 at the time, so hearing this was incredibly shocking. However, something like that happening so close to me, even more so, freaked me out for some reason so deeply. I'm not quite sure how reliable this is, but according to Chad, the mother didn't want her daughter's relationship to go sexual until she and her boyfriend were married. She also didn't like them to get married because apparently the boyfriend was kind of not the best guy and was pretty abusive, but those are just rumors. Now apparently, when the girlfriend's mother told him he no longer had her blessing for marriage, he lost it and formulated a plan to kill her. I was absolutely disgusted and disturbed at such a selfish, pathetic, and creepy motive. This so-called man murdered an innocent woman just because he wanted to have sex with her daughter and was delusional enough to believe that she would go along with him after he carried out such a gruesome act. One day on the way home from school, my mom pointed out that the funeral procession was happening around our neighborhood. It honestly surprised me that it was so close to where we lived. I remember seeing Mike in his black suit and tie with a very sad look. At school, I remember seeing him and being a pretty easygoing, cheerful guy who enjoyed cracking jokes. But after this, he was dark and seeming like he was very terrified all the time. Horror like this will stay with you. But honestly, I just remembered that life is short and very precious. I don't know if Mike ever returned to school for the rest of that semester. I don't really remember. I do not know what I would have said to him even if he did. What the hell do you say to somebody who just honestly saw somebody that they love have their life ended? What do you say to somebody whose mother had just been taken away by some heartless monster? Dead Pigs in a Ditch by Jeannie I. I live with my family in the rural countryside about an hour away from any significant cities, about 20 minutes away from any real towns. It is essential to understand how isolated this area is. The cell service around here has issues, to say the least. We have tons of mountains and trees here in Washington. But anyway, there's a place we have always had to go through when going home, and we call it the hole because the service cuts out for about six miles. It wouldn't be so odd if the service hadn't been so excellent before then, like full 5G bars and everything, and then suddenly, nada. There's a curb where a community book nook, I guess if that's what you call it is. You take a book and leave it, that type thing. It's built like a birdhouse. We stop there from time to time, but not after this. It's in the middle of July. It's hot and arid. We get out and there's a god-awful smell. It smells like carcasses which isn't rare for out here, animals die, it's a part of life, but this was terrible, worse than any other time I've been out here. We started to look around when my sister told me to look down in the ditch. This is a steep drop off. We couldn't have gone down there even if we wanted to. I have a hard time seeing it at first, and then I see multiple shapes I can't quite process. We raise pigs, and their heads are recognizable. They're fat, and their snouts point out. It's a pig head, and it's not just one, but multiple. Then when we look closer, we see ribs, pig heads. I, I understand, but I couldn't at the same time. Now, farmers don't waste meat. The body is decaying, and we can see the flesh rotting off. There are, there are at least three to four that we can see, 
and at least one deer head, which is also weird because even if you don't collect the deer head, you can certainly sell them for an excellent price. The horns and all that stuff were massive. It was a big buck. This was strange even for the countryside. You don't just throw carcasses into a random place, as it would definitely attract scavengers and probably other predators. And again, you just don't waste meat like this. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it was odd, and it stuck with me my whole life. Now, maybe the animals were sick, but then why the deer head? I don't know. When Living in Isolation Goes Wrong by Anonymous This had to have happened sometime in the early 2000s. The exact year escapes me. My husband was still spending most of his time on the road working for one of the major insurance companies at the time. As a result of this, myself and our young daughter spent most of our days alone. A few years prior, we had purchased a new home on a somewhat isolated piece of land, and the journey between town and home could often be harrowing, especially at times of heavy rain. It was the middle of nowhere. Most of the last five miles of the road that led to the house was nothing more than loose gravel, and wasn't very wide, for that matter. My daughter and I found ourselves stuck on this part of the road on a bad night. I did all I could to keep our old Subaru on the road, but the rain made visibility almost impossible. It wasn't long until I misjudged the one curve and ended up in a ditch. Fortunately, my husband had the foresight to sign us up for one of those roadside assistant programs. I contacted them and was told that the weather was keeping them busy, but they would get to us as soon as possible. Not knowing how long we would be stuck there, I made my daughter as comfortable as I could and waited. The rain stopped soon after and I was now able to see how far away from home we were. I estimated it was only about two and a half miles to the house and considered walking, until remembering no one was at home to retrieve the car later. Help was on its way, so I could wait. Within ten minutes of the accident, I could see headlights of a truck coming toward us and began to get excited. However, it didn't turn out to be a tow truck. Instead, it was an older man driving a rusty pickup. When he saw my car, he slowed down and investigated it. As he passed, I thought he was about to offer to pull us out, but he continued down the road. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but five minutes later the rusty pickup truck approached us coming from the other direction at a very slow speed. He stared at me once again as he passed, even making eye contact with me briefly, but didn't stop. Things were beginning to look odd, but I thought maybe he was lost and turning around to return to the highway. He wasn't obligated to help. Perhaps he thought I was parked instead of stuck. He probably wasn't from around here and just was trying to get home like I was. Things didn't start to get scary until I noticed the same truck coming toward us for a third time. It had quickly gotten completely dark by this point, and most women I know feel much less safe when the sun goes down. This situation did not make things feel any less sketchy. He did his usual, by now, slow drive-by. What was different this time was that he had stopped the truck after he had passed and did a quick three-point turn in the road. He was now facing us again, stopped about ten yards away, Rather than get out and come over to offer aid, he sat in the cab and watched for a few minutes. Only now did he open the door and begin to get out of the truck. Almost as soon as he hit the pavement, a pair of headlights appeared in the other direction. The man stayed where he was, watching and waiting for a minute before it was close enough to see it was a wrecker. Once he saw this, he jumped back into his cab and made a U-turn and sped away from us. My heart was stuck in my throat as I watched this play out, and not until I could read the name of the company on the side of the tow truck could I begin to relax. The tow truck driver didn't hesitate to pull his truck in front of us, hook up my car, and I was finally confident that they were there to help. I got out to thank him. He had us out of the ditch in just a few minutes and we were on our way. For the remainder of the journey, I kept my eyes open for the rusty truck, and even as I drove up our drive, I feared I would see him setting in wait. Luckily, he was not, though, and happily I got my daughter out and into the house. When my husband returned from his latest trip, I told him about what had happened during the last storm, but I left out the part with the strange truck. I knew it would only make him more stressed when he was away, and at the time he had no other choice but to continue his trips. Because of this latest trouble, he went out of the way and purchased an almost all new Jeep with a 4x4 transmission for me. I was over the moon to get it, and I never got stuck again, even on the muddy parts of our property. It didn't take long for the stranger in the rusty truck to pass from my mind. 
However, for the next two weeks, I caught myself looking for it any time I was on that stretch of road. I had almost completely forgotten about the incident, until just recently, when I saw a truck just like it at the store. It, of course, was not the same one, but it caused me to freak out a little bit. It caused all those memories to come flooding back and motivated me to write this. Fortunately, in the preceding years since then, the county has paved and widened the roads and my wonderful husband gets to come home to us every single night. Boone County Blues by Anonymous If anyone has ever seen the wild and wonderful whites of West Virginia before, this is the exact area where this event occurred. I literally had to drive by their house on the way. Hank Williams III also wrote a song about it called Boone County Blues, which really captures the essence of the depressing, drug-consumed area. I worked as a lab technician for an independent company. I would run an analysis on coal samples to determine the quality. Ash, sulfurs, whatever, things of that nature. Part of the job was driving company pickup trucks to various coal mines, train loadouts, and river docks to draft barges and collect samples. We got a call at around 2 a.m. to go pick up a training sample over in an incredibly remote area in the middle of nowhere. It was a mine, and the mine was miles away from absolutely anything. To get there, I had to drive across a place called Williams Mountain, home of Jesco and all the other whites. It's a notoriously steep, curvy, and dangerous mountain with a very high rate of accidents. I made it to the mine and collected the sample without incident. After about 15 minutes of driving, I started back up the steep mountain. Having made the trip numerous times, I could take the curves fast, especially when it's pitch dark, and you can see headlights approaching you. The nearest stop lights, stop signs, or street lights are a good 30 miles away, so it's a different kind of dark. The complete darkness just perfectly compounds the isolation. It was because I was driving so fast that I was completely caught by surprise when it appeared that there was a vehicle quickly catching me. I started speeding up, but before I knew it, they had caught up with me. When they got close, they turned on their high beams, and I could tell it was a truck from the height of the lights. But the bright lights had me somewhat blinded. It was then when the terror really began. They started edging closer and closer until they were right up on my ass. It didn't matter how fast I went. They stayed right up on me. Suddenly, they stopped in the road and killed the headlights, completely weirded out, and rattled to my core. I took a huge sigh of relief and started laughing nervously as they dropped from sight. Thinking it was just some idea of a cruel joke, never had I been so ready to see that city skyline. Not too long after, and to my complete and utter horror, the lights started quickly climbing the mountain once again. Frantic, I punched the gas, almost wrecking twice trying to flee but it was no use. Again, the bright lights filled up my mirrors and simultaneously filled my heart with fear and absolute dread. They would back off a little bit, then get extremely close, repeating this over and over until they finally rammed me twice. The second time was hard enough to make me swerve, though thankfully, I was able to ride it out. I should note that there is nowhere to pull off while traversing the mountain, just guardrails on either side and drop-offs wherever the rails are missing. There is only one little church on a wide spot of the road, so I tried to pull over to let them pass. I put on the signal and turned off, but my pursuers turned off as well and killed their lights. I ducked down but tried to watch for any movement. Nothing. Two or three minutes probably goes by, and I made my mood to frantically peel out. To my unimaginable relief, they didn't pull out, but I wasn't convinced it was over. Sure enough, the lights approached once more, though this time it was accompanied by a sound an unmistakable gut-wrenching sound of gunshots. I had heard the term hyperventilate, but at that moment I discovered the full force of its meaning. Barely able to breathe, I ducked down as low as I could and started reciting a nonsensical plea for help. This was before cell phones were popular, but to this day, service is non-existent there. The bullets rang out like a soundtrack for my misery, and all I could do was just think at that moment if I would ever see my loved ones again. Time is truly subjective. It felt as though I was on the mountain for days, but I finally reached the end, eventually saw a few houses, and immediately pulled into the first I could. The truck didn't turn down the driveway, but lingered in the road, with the headlights off. After a couple of minutes, a porch light came on and the truck did a donut, 
then started back up the mountain. A man emerged from the home, but I left as soon as the truck's lights were out of sight. I yelled sorry out of the window and drove like a reckless lunatic the rest of the way. I did end up getting pulled over for speeding on the highway. I didn't even attempt to explain, as I figured it was a small price to pay, all things considered. Obviously, I never entertained the idea of ever making that run again, and my boss started collecting samples in the daytime only for that site. The mountains of West Virginia are incredibly beautiful, but there's also a lot of danger lurking in the depths of their remote location. Places that inspire movies like Wrong Turn. Places where no one can hear you scream. Close Calls While Hitchhiking by Anonymous So I am a 39-year-old female, and many moons ago, sometime between the ages of 15 and 17, when it was still the 90s, me and another girl used to go hitchhiking across the country. When we first went on our little adventure, it never even crossed our minds we might one day need some form of weapon on us for self-defense purposes. So, it was a long time before we got one, and this is a story of two instances before that time came, when we would have been in much better positions if we had one. The first one was in Pueblo, Colorado. We were sitting at a gas station contemplating walking up the highway when some random guy told us that he couldn't really take us anywhere, but if we were willing to cook, he'd take us home with him and feed us and let us shower, etc. And while an offer like this may be a red flag for most people, this was well into our time hitchhiking and was a common occurrence, so we agreed. Something we ended up discovering throughout our adventure was that people that didn't converse much were the ones you should probably be worried about the most. This guy didn't really say hardly anything all the way there, and there was deep into the wilderness in the middle of the mountainous somewhere. And if you are familiar with where Pueblo is, you'd know the mountains are pretty far away from there. So we were already getting the creeps, just knowing how far from civilization we were headed. We finally get there, and the guy's giving us both a weird feeling. It's very off and just feels evil. We agree it is not a good idea to stay. So in less than five minutes after arriving at this middle of nowhere cabin in the woods, we tell him we've changed our minds and want to leave. He seems truly irritated but agrees to take us back after some back and forth. By this time, we of course have obviously no clue where we are or which direction is which, and we are both getting worried. And as we venture out into the woods again, we begin discussing with one another the fact that it feels like it's taking a lot longer to get back than it did to get there. And we both begin to wonder if we are actually going back or if maybe we're going further into the wilderness. And to make it even worse, we have not spotted even one other vehicle passing us or heading the same direction the entire time. So, now, the conversation is going towards what we might be doing, and if he's leading us further into the woods to our demise. We both agree that there is at least two of us and only one of him, even if we are both beginning to panic and sweat. So, all we can do is pray and wait it out. And although it still is well over 20 years later, it feels like it was twice as long to return than it did to make it there, and eventually we did make it back to the gas station where we started. He both let us out and we went on our way. The second instant was just outside of Sacramento, California. We had been traveling with a big fat trucker that was also no conversationalist. Even as much as we tried prompting him to talk to us, he had little to nothing to say. We had been traveling in his truck for a few hours and we both had fallen asleep till I was abruptly awakened by my traveling companion. The truck stopped on the side of the highway and my friend was adamant about us exiting the vehicle immediately. I asked her why and what was wrong, and she told me she had been awakened by the trucker feeling her breast in her sleep. She said his exact words were, After all I've done for you, you can't let me cop a feel? So we got out of the truck, literally on the side of the highway somewhere in Sacramento, but we walked away unharmed, and almost completely unviolated. And amazingly enough, out of the nearly three years of hitchhiking cross-country together, those were the only two real times anything really scary happened to us, and it was the best time of my entire life to this day. Be careful when you're out there. There are a lot of bad people, but definitely don't be scared to live your life and have adventures.
Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true middle of nowhere horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it in at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You can also submit stories on reddit via r slash the dark swamp. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to elbow that like button right in the face so it knows you mean business. Subscribe if you're new and be sure to turn on notifications so you don't miss any new episodes as I upload multiple new episodes every single week on all things natural and supernatural. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium, but you would like to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, even if you don't have data, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcast, Deezer Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. It's absolutely free and always will be. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. It helps me pick better stories and I love seeing your reviews. If you made it all the way to the end, today's code word is Orange House. Be sure to comment Orange House in the comments. The funniest one will be pinned at the top of the comment section. This is always something fun that we like to do, just to see how many people make it to the end and to confuse anybody who doesn't. It's always funny to see people who just come to videos and scroll down to the comments to see what's going on. Thank you guys so much for supporting the Swamp the way you do. Be sure to join me over there on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, Instagram, Facebook, all the fun social medias, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.